Well, welcome everybody. I am so glad all of you are here. Um, special thank you to all the people that came just to hear me preach. I really appreciate that. You know who you are and I love you all very, very much. Um, despite the purple hair, the tattoos and the piercings and my general attitude, I actually was an obedient child growing up. My mother can testify to that um, because she was uh, instrumental in making sure that I stayed obedient. Um, the one, and mostly if I'm disobedient in general, but especially when I was a teen, the disobedience tended to revolve around those things called rules. And if they were a thing called stupid, and I thought they were stupid, they just didn't need to be followed. I didn't see the issue. So this was especially true around music, um, especially about music television, and you should know what I'm meaning, MTV. My parents said, Brandon, you're not allowed to watch MTV. I knew it was channel 28. I knew to skip it. Like, it was not that big of a deal to me, except in 2003, when the greatest band of all time, Evanescence, was playing uh, the MTV Music Awards, which if you know anything about the MTV Music Award, they're a little racy, they're a little dicey. I get it now as an adult why they wouldn't want a teen watching it, but to be fair, I really wasn't watching it for everything that would actually happen at that very specific MTV Music Award. I just wanted to see Evanescence. They're the greatest band of all time. I just wanted to see them perform. And so my parents were upstairs, I was downstairs, and I was flipping back and forth, flipping back and forth, and then Evanescence came on, and I watched it, and everything was great, until my mom came downstairs to grab a cup of water, and she caught me. And there was a week-long TV ban, um, which, to be fair, isn't that much of a punishment. I didn't watch a ton of TV, still don't really watch as much TV. Um, I tend to read, so it wasn't a huge punishment. But the funny end of the story was <clears throat> I kind of sort of forgot that I had been grounded from the TV the next morning. Um, and my mom came strolling downstairs getting ready for work and there was Rhiannon laying diagonally um, like any good teenager in the armchair just watching TV. And I just kind of heard her clear her throat and I like looked at her and I was like, I, what's the issue? I don't see the, oh, right, I'm not supposed to be doing this. And I went a little pale and she just was like, it's fine, I know you forgot, like just go upstairs, like just continue, right? So obedience for me is actually like, pretty easy to a certain extent. Again, it's about like 90%. If I don't think it's a good rule, I don't want to follow it. And only about 10%, like if you tell me to do something, I just will be stubborn and just not do it. Um, and the stubbornness is natural to who I am. I am just naturally stubborn. Um, but the one place of my life that obedience is always been like super easy for me is my walk with Jesus, which is actually not exactly as cut and dry as it sounds. So in middle school, when I became a Christian, I kind of heard this theology, notice my use of air quotes theology, um, that if God asks you to do, like if you say, God, I don't want to do blah, then God will make you do it. And I like was stupid, and I was like, that's not true, this will be fine. And one night after a missions speaker, I was like, Lord, I will do anything for you, just don't call me to be a missionary. <laughs> so when I was 16, I was called to be a missionary. <laughs> and it's actually a really cool experience, and I'd love to share it with you sometime, so feel free to pull me aside and be like, Rhiannon, show it's this really cool experience. But the thing about it was, is that it was cut and dry. It was like, yep, this is what you're going to do. And so there was no room for argument. So I was like, okay, the Lord said to do it, so I'm going to do it. So I pursued it. And this part of my life can actually be best described um, by the story of Abram. So if you don't know who Abram is, he's who eventually becomes Abraham. And I don't know the song, but if you know the song, sing with me. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. There we go, right? That dude. That dude is the dude in this story. And so he's, um, he's just kind of chilling, doing his own thing, and God comes radically into the story um, in Genesis 12 where it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. So Abram went 
as the Lord had told him, it pretty much can sum up my life post July of 2007 on. Jesus said very clearly in an audible voice kind of moment, I have called you to this. You are to be a missionary. So I stopped looking at state schools. I was a junior at this time, and I just stopped looking at state schools and started looking at exclusively Christian schools. I went on any mission trip that was offered. First it was to San Francisco, then it was to Guatemala, then I went to Christian school to study missions, and I was, went to Vancouver, BC, which that's in Canada, in case you didn't know. Then when Christian college didn't really work out, I came back and then went to Moldova and then Cambodia. And you're probably going, wow, Rhiannon, this thing, this like following God thing must be so easy for you because you get to go to all these fun, exciting places. You don't know me. My two least favorite types of food are Asian food and Mexican food. Can you guess what you almost exclusively get in San Francisco, Cambodia, Guatemala, and San Francisco? Latin American and Asian food, you guessed it. So this was incredibly difficult for me because food means a lot to me. I enjoy food. And then when I went to Moldova, you're like, Rhiannon, it's a Russian-speaking country. This will be fine. It's not fine. Have you ever had overcooked pizza with fake pepperoni, jalapenos, and corn? No? Anybody? Anybody? It don't. It's disgusting. And I was, and the Lord was like, Rhiannon, you're going to go on this trip? And I'm like, really? Can we just go somewhere where the, like, the food and the culture makes sense to me? Like, ah! And Jesus is like, called you to be a missionary. You got to go. And so while these situations were hard, they were also fun and exciting, and they taught me a lot. And that's also pretty much how I ended up in Kansas. In fact, these verses that we just read were the last verses that Pastor Brad, who's a pastor that means a lot to me, said to me the last service I had under him before I went to Kansas. Because shortly after I moved to Kansas, I met people that would like truly change my life. They worked for a campus ministry, um, and the work they were doing and the students that they were involved with were amazing. Like, when's the last time you saw like a 20-year-old that's like preaching out of Psalms and rocking it? I was like, I don't even know how to process what's happening right now. And it was pretty much amazing until, and I was like, this is it. This is going to be my job for the rest of my life. This is what I'm gonna do. I found my mission path, this is great. Until about October of 2016, um, things just like not kind of fell apart, but like poof, fell apart. And from October of 2016 to May of 2018, yes, that's how bad it was. I remember exact days. I questioned everything about my life. Nothing was off the table, including something I never thought I'd question, which is the goodness of God. You don't understand me until you understand that everything in my theology is critical and is just wrapped around one thing, God is love. And if God is not good, and if God is not kind, and if God is not love, then I don't know how to function. So to think even for a brief moment that God was not good, kind, or loving devastated me to the core of I just didn't even know how to function. When I kind of woke up out of this fog of just like the initial implosion, and I woke up and I was like, okay, this is fine. It's at the end of the semester. My students are trapped in finals anyway. They're not coming to any events. I can just, it's fine. My supervisors know what's going on. So if things go really pear-shaped, like they can cover it. And I was just like, Lord, like, you, you know what's going on in my heart? Me and you aren't that great right now. So can we just stop this ministry thing? Can we just, let, let's just stop here. Um, it's been a great run, and let's just move on. And the Lord said, no, Rhiannon, I called you to stay. And you already know my answer. I called you to stay for several years. What do you do with that? And what do you do when you're at, with a Christian organization and your staff, and there's not one but two Christian staff conferences, and you think you're not sure that God is good right now, and it's at the height of the good, good father craze? 
Huh? Huh? Anybody? Just picture this with me. There's 1,500 people singing Good, Good Father on key, like four-part harmony, a cappella, and you're just standing there like, I don't know if God is good. I don't know what's going on. It was devastating and just really embarrassing because I'm like, oh, I work with you and you, and I just wasn't sure that God was good. And when I kind of woke up out of the fog, it really, the question that came to mind was, can we be obedient? Can I be obedient even when it hurts to be obedient? And there's this other kind of like theology that um, I've been exposed to that if God asks you to do something and, does it, and it doesn't hurt, is God really asking you to do something? And there's like a measure of me that's like, yeah, that's probably a little true. I mean, if you looked at the rest of the story of Abram and Sarai, it's a story that's full of lies and death and destruction that sometimes we forget about what comes out of it, which is hope, joy, and renewal. God knew exactly what would happen when I left for Kansas. He knew that my faith would be shaken. He knew that I would get hurt. And he knew that I would feel like I had been taken apart at the seams and put back together wrong, and he still told me to go. What do you do with that? And I think at the end of the day, the reason why God wanted me there is because he knew that in Kansas at that time was the perfect time for somebody like me. Because you see, two days before I preached for the first time ever, I decided it would be a great idea to dye my whole head blue. Not the tips like this, but my whole head, not even, not even a pretty shade of blue, but kind of an ugly shade of blue. I fully admit this. And I did not do this with any kind of like statement. I just kind of forgot I was preaching on Sunday, went and bought blue dye and dyed my hair blue because I'm impulsive like that. And it actually ended up being the best ministry thing I could have done my first year on staff because when I was there um, in Kansas, Kansas is kind of a clean-cut state. I stick out like a sore thumb just existing. Um, and we were outside um, just proxying, which means just to like talk about Jesus with random people. It's great. And we were talking, and I was like kind of distracted. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my supervisor, a nice clean-cut woman from Iowa, just gesturing at me to this freshman. And this freshman went from kind of like, I don't know what's going on, to like, oh, okay, I could get behind this. So I circled back with my supervisor later and I was like hey so why were you gesturing at me it was a little weird (laughs) and she went well this freshman was actually like came up to me and went you know what I'm pretty weird how do I know I'll fit into your Jesus club so then she pointed at me and went that's my staff partner you can't out weird her and if you know me um you can't nice try though (laughs) And me and this freshman actually remain really good friends. They're one of the few people that I like really, really, really dug. And my supervisor's right, he, they couldn't out weird me at all, though they did try. But my weirdness and tenacity was what was needed in a space where just being a little off kilter got me indoors that nobody else could get into. So I have a couple of questions today. What if that thing that God is asking you to do, adopt a child from another country, leave a job, move to another state, marry that specific person, step in leadership at church or wherever, is because God knows the fullness of who you are, blue hair and all, is exactly what's needed for such a time as this. Now, I, it, I mean, if you haven't taken a guess, I'm a naturally pessimistic and kind of dark person. <laughs> if you just looked at my music licks, you'd be like, Rihanna, do you need help? No, I'm fine. I'm just a little somber. <laughs> so the whole, like, you know, obey even when it hurts actually, like, really fits in well with my theology. I'm like, yeah, no, it makes sense. There's almost a sense of, like, a spiritual reserve of, like, God, I obeyed when it was hard. Like, you know, so now you have to answer. So there's, like, Like I said, it's a dark part of me. But my second point is this. Can we be obedient even when life is going well? So, again, 
it's pretty, it makes sense, right? Things are going badly, you're obedient, they start going well, then you praise God and you stay obedient. But then that, like, things start going well is kind of where we tend to be like, okay, thanks God, you know, goodbye. And there's not a need anymore to feel obedient. Because life is going pretty well. Mm, Why mess it up with this whole obedience thing? I'd like to share one of my favorite stories in the Bible um, about a chick that personally I feel was like super on fire. Her name is Lydia. And we find her story in the book of Acts starting in verse 16. So to kind of set the stage a little bit, Paul, Timothy, and oh my gosh, totally just space. No, Luke. Luke. You think it would be Silas, but it's Luke. Are traveling. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Um, Timothy, I am missing on my names. There we go. Timothy is a young Greek guy, and Paul was formerly Saul, so when he was Saul, he liked to kill Christians. Now he's Paul, and he wants to, everyone to become Christians, so he's traveling from synagogue to synagogue, trying to tell people, Jewish people specifically, how to follow God and how they can kind of connect. So this is where we enter, right? Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Nigeria and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. They came to the border of Mysia. They traveled to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Thamarisi, and the next day we went on to Nepolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside to the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the gospel message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. So some cultural background, in case you don't know, a synagogue could only exist in a Jewish community if 10 or more Jewish men resided there. Not if they went to synagogue, just like 10 Jewish men existed. Right? So Paul and his companions right, had been traveling from synagogue to synagogue, which means they kind of sort of knew this rule. And so that's kind of weird to me, right? That they're going to go for a synagogue. There is no synagogue, so, but they were looking for a Macedonian man. And yet they decided to go to the river where they knew they'd find a place of prayer of almost exclusively women and children. So you're looking for a man, but you go to a place that almost has exclusively women and children. That's where the story starts to get neat, but it gets even neater with Lydia. Because what do we know about Lydia? So Lydia is from Thyatira, which means she's from out of town. She's not a local, right? She's a dealer in purple cloth, which means she has some money, but not so much money that like the upper echelon is like, hey, come hang with us. She's just like middle class, right? So she can provide for her and her household, but not much more than that. But what's the most important and striking to me is that she was a worshiper of God. She was a worshiper of God, but she wasn't, likely wasn't Jewish. So she was from out of town, wasn't really Jewish, had enough money to provide. So what was her reasoning to go and be around on a Sabbath at a place of worship? And if you're getting the hint of my sermon, Obedience. She's obedient to what God was calling her to, even though her life was going well. Everything was fine. She had no reason to be there. There wasn't even the social pressure, right? Sometimes there's social pressure to show up to religious things. She didn't have that. She wasn't Jewish. She was the head of her household. Why would she show up? Except through obedience. So what does that look like for you today? It doesn't matter if you aren't on the journey with God or you've been doing it for 85 years. There is always a next step of obedience. 
And I don't know what that looks like for you. So take a moment and just think, what would the next step of obedience look like to me? Maybe there's a nudging in your heart already that God's kind of being like, hey, 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 do you want to do that? That would be cool. God's, God hits me in the head with two by fours. He might just nudge you. I don't know. I'm hoping it's not a two by four situation. Again, the stubbornness thing is a thing. And what comes from obedience when life is going badly and when life is going well is that we get blessing, but not like, don't hear me, don't be like, blessings, money from heaven. Like, no. I'm talking about like soul quenching blessing. Working in that really hard situation with the campus ministry, I personally got to lead 12 people to Christ. That was amazing. I would not trade it for anything in the world. I also got to complete stupid goals, like my goal of like going to every, all 50 states, got to go to all 50 states. That's a really silly goal and very arbitrary. My brother is like, random, that means nothing. It meant a lot to me. But because I lived in Kansas in the middle of the country, I, it was really easy to get places. I got to meet people who are visionaries in their field. I got to meet people that were in the lowest of their lowest situations and come alongside them and build them back up. I got to see the best sunrises. I'm sorry, until you've been in Kansas and seen a sunrise there, you ain't seen a sunrise. It is amazing. And I also got to visit some of the tiniest towns in rural America and meet people that loved their communities. Though I could never live in a 150 person town, I met people who did, and they were some really great people. That's the kind of blessing I'm talking about. The soul quenching blessing, the blessing that doesn't make sense. The blessing that only makes sense to me because it's between me and God. And I love that the story of Lydia's faithfulness doesn't end in that chapter either of Acts. It ends when, it doesn't even end when she invites Paul and his companions back into her home after they had been jailed and then released. It continues in the book of Philippi, uh, Philippians, right? See, I even messed it up, right? The church of Philippi becomes the Philippians. There we go. Words are hard. And it continues. So hear what Paul says about the Philippians. Yet it was good of you to share my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. If you've ever read a book by Paul, this is like the loudest ringing endorsement you could ever have. He's typically pretty harsh on churches. He's pretty much just like, this is what you're doing wrong, and this is what you're doing wrong, and this is what you're doing wrong, but hold fast to the faith. Not so with the Philippians. He is encouraging, and even when he takes a moment to chastise them, it's very, very mild. And I believe that that is in part because of Lydia's influence, because she taught them to be generous. Again, look at that. You, not one church, shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. They gave and received freely, and I think that's in part because Lydia taught them what does it mean to be generous to a fault and then still give. That's really just neat and cool to me. And then Paul says earlier in his letter, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion of Christ Jesus. I thank my God every time I remember you. Paul writes, I don't know if you know this, Paul writes like two-thirds of the Bible, so that's a pretty intense endorsement. Like, I thank my God every time I remember you. I honestly would like kill for that kind of endorsement. Well, not kill because that's a sin, but you get my point. You get my point, right? Like, this is pretty awesome. Paul is saying, I thank my God every time I remember you. Because you were obedient, because you stuck with the faith, because you did the thing, I remember you, and I thank my God. Obeying when life is hard and obeying when life is going well, that's what gets you this kind of endorsements. 
And it makes me ask the question, can we stay faithful? Can we be faithful in the everyday mess of life? Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Paul is still addressing the Philippians there, and he's specifically talking about this mundane life, that we must stay faithful in this everyday mess. Because I don't know about you guys, but I feel that life is like hard, but really good. Like, super intense and kind of messy, but amazing. So what does it look like to be faithful in that? Can we stay faithful? Can we still look towards God as our hope and salvation when things are just straightforward? Can we trust God enough? I'm putting the enough there because trusting God can be hard. But can you trust God enough to let God work in our lives? For it is God who works in you and to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And trust me, I know on a very personal level, if you haven't gotten the hint yet, that letting God work in your life is not easy. But it is rewarding. Especially since God created our souls with intentionality. He knows what we need even when we don't think we need it. God knows. So this is a time for a slight confession. So just bear through the confession, and then we'll get to the end, and I promise it'll, it'll end well, wrap up real nice. So my confession is this. I don't like Reno. Oh, no. I never have. When I was young, my mom took me to see her family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I was like, this is it. This is where I'm going to live. And then we went to New York, and I was like, oh, this is definitely it. We went to D.C. a little less convinced, Williamsburg, Virginia, also a little less convinced. But pretty much until I got my call to be a missionary, I was done with Reno. I was like, East Coast is the best coast. Like, I was out of here. And then Jesus was like, "Ah, put your brakes on that. Time for you to go to school where I say to go, and I'm saying Idaho, and I'm like, oh, okay, Lord, I will do as you will, but this hurts. And when I came back from Christian college, wasn't too happy to be coming back, and I was like, Lord, take me somewhere else, and he's like, nope, you're going home, okay. And then I went to Kansas, which, by the way, didn't want to go to Kansas, didn't like Kansas, it was too cold, people thought I was too much, didn't really fit in, but, you know, whatever. It was fine. The Lord would eventually release me. And when he did, I was like, okay, ready, here we go. Pulled out my laptop, started going flights to Miami. How much does it cost to move to New York? You know, like 20 signs that, you know, you're supposed to live in Seattle. I mean, like every website, like BuzzFeed quiz that I possibly could do, I did because I was like, nope, I'm not going home and I'm not staying in Kansas. So that means there's somewhere else. There's the next adventure. And God circled back, and he was like, hey, Rhiannon, uh, pretty clear that you're supposed to go back home. And I was like, is it, though? Is it really that clear? And God's like, what, what, what do you think? And he's like, I told you years ago that you're going to help David with the church plant. And I was like, he could move. This is fine. I'm, I'm sure that he would just love, like, Toronto up in Canada. That would be swell, Germany, Miami, anywhere, anywhere. Like, Lord, come on, just move him. Just move him anywhere. And Jesus was like, Rhiannon, slow your jets, go home. And coming home has been a very interesting thing because it's been so average. I just, I'm like, what do you mean, like, every single day? That I've been back for 11 months, and I was like, what happened? That things are good. The things are just kind of like chill and easy. I mean, met new friends. They're fabulous. Reconnected with old friends. I have to give a shout out to Evan. We realized that we hadn't seen each other face to face in five years because our like times never coincided. And so life has just been average, right? You kind of reconnect. You leave home. You come back, and you reconnect with people. No big deal, right? And I've been kind of the last couple of weeks just been like, Lord, okay, like. Yes, church plants are exciting, but, like, let's look a year in the future. Like, there's something else, right? There's, there's just the next thing that's not in Reno. And the Lord's like, Rhiannon, can you be faithful in the everyday mess? <sighs> yes, Lord. Okay. 
So yesterday I was helping John and Mary pack up their house because um, they're getting ready to move houses because they're just awesome like that and they do with things like that. And I was helping and I was like wiping down like shelves and like looking, like snooping through yearbooks because they let me. And let me just say, <laughs> the late 90s, early 2000s were not kind in fashion to anyone. Um, and I had a grand old time. And there was just this moment where I was just kind of like walking out from like between the two houses, like putting stuff away. And it was like such a classic Nevada day for my childhood. Cause like the sun was out and there was no, like no clouds in the sky, right? Like Nevada, no clouds in the sky. And it was like not too hot, but not too cold. Just like perfect warm, enough breeze that you're like, oh, hey, there's wind here. Like it was the perfect day. And then, you know, the lady across the street started blaring her country music, and I was like, oh, yep, yep, nope, I'm back in, I'm back in Nevada. There's the country music, and there was the guy down the street mowing his lawn, and I was like, wow, this is such an average day. And then the strangest thing happened. The lady with the country music started blasting her water, 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 power washer, thank you, Mary, power washer <laughs> to clean up her patio. And the smell of the water hitting the cement and I was like instantly just like oh wow I'm home and if you're just like why is that smell so dis distinct because we're at a higher temp at higher altitude and it's a really arid place so actually the smell that of cement and water is actually a completely different smell than it is other places in the country I know because I've smelt them and that moment of just like wow, I'm home, and then that, that deeper sink back of like, oh yeah, this is home. This is where peace is. This is where joy can be. Because that ragtag soul that kind of went through some hard stuff for a couple of years came back to the one place that would heal it deeply. Can you be faithful in the everyday mess? One of the last Sundays I was in Kansas, I heard the song So Will I for the first time. And again, if you haven't gotten the hint yet, Kansas was a little rough, especially near the end. And I was real checked out in church that morning. And I was kind of zoning in and out. And then out of nowhere, the last verse came in that says, and as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done, every part designed in a work of art called a love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. To understand me is to understand something very simple. It's irrational, I know this, don't remind me. I consider myself on a daily basis to be a failure. And especially after the end of Kansas, because when things didn't go great, it was just repeating the cycles of I'm a failure, I am nothing, I am worthless. So to hear for even a moment that as God speaks truth into my life, a hundred billion failures, I can never fail that much, and a hundred billion failures disappear. And that the graves that I was living in, the graves of rejection and hurt and pain, I didn't need to stay in them because God already rose out of that grave and I didn't need to put myself back in. And if God gladly chose surrender, so will I. We have a choice every single day to choose whether or not we will sacrifice, surrender our lives to Christ. What does your next step of obedience look like? Maybe life is not going well right now. Do you trust God enough to say yes to whatever hard thing he's asking you to do? Maybe life is going pretty well and you're like, hey, I don't want to do this obedience thing. It sounds hard. I don't like this. Can you trust God just, just a little to just kind of shake things up? And maybe, just maybe, if we stay faithful in the everyday mess, God will do something that will heal our souls in ways we didn't know we needed. I know I wanted adventure, but I didn't know I needed rest. There's always a next step. 
And when the blessings, when they eventually come, because sometimes mine was 11 months in the waking, but when the blessings of obedience come, they're always worth everything you went through. Let's pray. God, you are good to us. Even when we are faithless, Lord, you are faithful. I pray, Lord, that you would help every single person here, Lord, to press into faithfulness, Lord, into obedience. Because, God, you have something for us in this moment. Jesus, I pray that as we look towards this potluck and ministry meeting, Lord, that this wonderful time of fellowship, God, but also a time of dreaming, Lord, that you be with us, that you would move, that you would help us see what you would have for us. Lord, not your will, not our will, Lord, but your will be done. We pray this all in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.